What's up guys? Thanks for stopping by. I hope you're doing good. Today, I am happy to share a type of video that does not exist anywhere else on the internet. I'm going to attempt to explain every single Balheim speedrun strat. This is gonna be one hell of an undertaking and there is so much to cover. I'm gonna have to keep each explanation brief just to fit it all in one video. And even then, it's probably gonna be a long one. So strap in, I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for future content. Let's jump into it. All right, before we get into the first strat, let's just address something right out the gate. These are the settings I use for the game. They are the most commonly used settings by most speedrunners. Some speedrunners may use a slight variation, but vegetation is always on the lowest setting because high vegetation, by comparison, makes it harder to spot objects on the ground, especially in the meadows. And draw distance is always on high to help with spotting important structures. Having everything else on low just helps get better FPS and higher FPS helps runners play better. I want to start out this video by going over all the boss strats first because I'm sure that's what people are most intrigued about. So with this strat, you can see with the sparkles that spawn in that you can tell where Eek's going to spawn. And if you place a series of fires right at that location, Eek will actually catch on fire right away. The optimal way to do this is to use about five campfires, but you can also one cycle with a lot less. And just in case Eek spawns in a more unusual location, it can be a good idea to use more fires. We use multiple campfires instead of just one because fire damage actually stacks. The strat for fighting the Elder is essentially exactly the same. You watch the sparkle to see where he's spawning. And then you put down as many campfires as you can in that spawn location. There is a potential added complication with the Elder that he might slide off. if he spawns at a weird angle but as long as he stays on oh like that that's actually the slide glitch as long as he stays on you just want to circle strafe around him and keep repairing those campfires just like with eek there but because he has more hp you just need to do it for longer now if he slide glitches off like he did here which is actually very common this is caused by him standing on a slope whilst being also on a fire so it's something you don't have any control over. And when it does happen, the best approach is just to try and get in close. Spam fires. When he does this attack that summons the roots, you can actually use that opportunity to spam a load of fires. And if you run away and get long range before the animation is over, it will actually keep him standing still on the fire. Because the Elder will immediately try a ranged attack once you're a certain distance away. And boom. That's how you deal with most Elders unless you're lucky enough to get a perfect spawn for one cycle. Okay, so now we get to a boss with a more complicated strat. This is the Bone Mass Cross Strat. The way you do this is by building a structure on the side of the skull that allows you to stay out of the range of Bone Mass's melee attacks. I'm going to start with a 2x2 two two floor piece and the way to judge the height is to look closely at the eye of the skull I'm actually going to fly a little bit so I can get really close to this and you can see right in front of my character here there's actually sort of a white line that comes horizontally out of the eye what you want to do is you want to aim for that line and that'd be where you place your first piece then we place two more because we need to make a cross. And we place the side ones. And then from here, we want to jump on top of the skull. Now we're up here, we can replace the workbench. And next we're going to work on shelter. There's a couple of different ways to do this. It doesn't really matter how you place your shelter. You just want to be really used to the way you do it so you can do it quickly. I like to place four one meter poles on each corner of the center piece. Then four two meter poles on top of those. This just makes sure it's the right height so you don't get stuck inside it when you place the bed in. Then a horizontal beam. This will allow me to place roofs more easily. And then we go for 26 degree batch roofs, which we attach to the horizontal piece. And we start placing them over every single floor tile. 
Now we've got a cross structure with shelter so we can do this fight without getting wet. The next thing you're going to want to do is place a bed somewhere under the shelter so you can just instantly spawn and not get wet. And you need to set this as your spawn. So for this bit, just do whatever you need to do to get shelter. Usually it involves placing a few wall pieces around your bed. Then these can be deconstructed. And next we worry about placing guardrails so that when we melee attack, we won't fall off the edge. I do this by aiming at the edge of the floor tile, then holding shift to remove snap, then place that beam. And then we can snap to the sides of that one beam and then rinse and repeat this for every side it's also a good idea to place barriers at the side in case you want to attack from there but it's not essential and another good safety strat is to actually place a wall that covers the entrance to the structure because it is extremely common for bow mass to cause enemies to spawn on top so doing this will just save you having to worry about close by enemies now we go ahead and summon bone mass and as he's spawning in we run up to our structure and jump inside it. Now, for this fight, we will be using a level 3 wooden club. Bone mass is weak to blunt. And the level 3 club is really easy to get. Because its mats are available all over the meadows and the black forest. Plus, it can be repaired with a level 1 workbench. So now, we kite bone mass just by standing on our bed. And when he gets close... We just spam attacks with the level 3 club. Basically until we die. You can see that his melee attacks don't actually reach us up here. And the only real danger comes from his poison attack which will eventually reach us. Eventually we will die of poison. But we'll respawn on the bed. And now we will no longer have a wet debuff because we have shelter. And a corpse from buff will allow us to last a little bit longer in the poison. There are a few variations on this strat. For example, you can just stockpile corpse runs within your structure before the fight. And that will allow you to maintain a rested buff if you get rested before. Because you won't actually have to die during the fight. But either way, you're having to kill your character a bunch. But it can be minimal time save for those that want to run a specific boss category however i recommend just focusing on doing it this way for anyone that wants to learn the speed run as for most runners adding extra complications and still learning the basics is just not worth it especially for minimal time save so eventually our club will break and the way we fix it is by placing a workbench on top of our bed within the shelter quickly get a repair in and then we can deconstruct that and continue the strat and resume the fight a couple of key points before we move on when selecting a side for the cross setup you want to make sure you select the side with the most amount of flat land because if bone mass is too low down when you kite him towards your structure you won't actually be able to reach him having bad terrain around the skull can really slow the strat down so you can use a hoe to level the ground if you want to remedy things a little bit but generally if you're in a category where all the tiles are really close, you could be completely screwed if you have a bad area around the boss. So just make sure you choose smartly. The best way to do bone mass on glitch speedruns is actually a little different. For this, you want to use a chair to clip into the skull, which you do by placing at the very edge, making sure the front of the chair clips inside. Then, if you sit on the chair, you can walk forwards and clip into the skull. I think a lot of players are aware of this, but we will talk more about clips later. Once we're inside, we then want to place a workbench so that we'll be able to repair our club. And this workbench will need a little shelter. Then we destroy the workbench on the outside. We summon bone mass. Then back into the skull through the chair and we make sure we actually deconstruct the chair before he appears. Because if there is any structure left outside of the skull, it will cause him to aggro. And in the process, if he's close by, he will most likely kill you along with the chair. For the rest of this strat, it's pretty straightforward. Bone Mass will just walk over to you and you just want to spam attack. However, I do recommend sort of standing behind the giant rune stone because obviously doing melee attacks causes your character to move forward. And if you leave this skull, the setup will fail. So it's not quite as easy as it looks because the skull is invisible from the inside. So positioning is very important with this strat. And of course, once your club breaks, you want to repair it and continue the fight. 
Next up is probably the most complicated boss setup. For this one, we actually dig a circular hole around the base of the boss altar to give ourselves a safe place where we can have a bed so we can respawn if we die and to stay out of reach from modders attacks. We'll talk more about how we survive the cold on the mountain later in the video, but when it comes to the actual boss fight, for the most consistent results I've found it's best to dig all the way around the altar because this gives us more options for AI manipulation. We then place a bed beneath the altar and set it as our spawn. Then we summon modder and jump down into the hole. Something to know about the modder AI is that when you're sheltered and the boss can't see you, she will fly directly above your head. Therefore, by staying in the hole, we can kite her to land directly above us. Once she has landed, we then place a bonfire and by standing still next to it, we can manipulate our AI to staying on the fire. As the bonfire takes damage, we repair it with the hammer. Then when she periodically takes off, we make sure we've got the shelter status. We'll know if we're doing the AI manip correct because if we are, she'll be flying directly above us and her wings will be clipping through the altar. Then eventually she'll land again and we can rinse and repeat the process. For extra DPS and speed, you can also throw spears through the gaps between the altar and the rock. This is also where we can shoot any additional arrows at modder. For instance, any poison arrows we may have gathered whilst in the swamp. As poison arrows on this fight can definitely make it a lot faster. For your glove, we use something I like to call the glove trap or the yag trap but this we want to dig a hole generally want to keep it on either the north south or east or west lines on the map so we use the mini map to line that up you want to dig down so your character's head is below the ground then you want to dig out four chunks to make a larger hole i do this by digging out the corner to my right then digging out the corner in front of me and then digging out the corner to the right of that then we dig out one of the corners to the side, which is where we're going to place the bonfire. This is so we have enough room for the most optimal setup. The next part can be a little finicky depending on your world generation, but you want to place a workbench in front of you in the left corner of the pit as close to either wall as possible. If the terrain's giving you trouble, you can always place wood planks on the floor to make sure that you're placing on a flat surface. Once the workbench is placed, you can then use a 26 degree thatch roof to create a one tile roof. You do this by having it snap to the left wall of the pit and having it angled over the workbench. Getting the positioning of this can be tricky, but basically you want to make sure your workbench is right in the middle of the thatch roof. This gives us a spot to repair our weapons. Next, we go out of the hole and we start covering it with floor tiles. The best way to do this is look for the lowest point and have the floor be exactly in line with the lowest point of the edge of the pit. Then we just cover the entire pit. This can take quite a lot of wood. I generally try and make sure I have around 100 wood before the Yag fight. However, the shape of your hole may vary exactly depending on how many problems you have with your terrain generation. So the exact amount may vary. We now have an almost completely flat Yag trap built. If you have any gaps, by the way, it's a good idea to plug it just in case Yag sees you. And now we want to go back inside the pit. The next step is optional, but I highly recommend it if you want the most consistent boss fights possible. I take a two meter wood pole and I snap it to the roof of the pit. This gives me an exactly two meter height measurement, which is basically the tightest space your character can fit in. Then I take wood floors and I snap it to the wall of the pit and I use the wood beam as a measurement for where I want the floor to be to make sure we're creating an exactly two meter high chamber for the character to stand in and then i build a sort of runway going up to the workbench then i place two meter wooden beams on the edge of the runway making sure i can still reach the workbench we then place the bonfire in the hole that we made in the corner of the pit it's now far enough away from us that we won't take damage and the barrier will stop us walking into the fire but it's still close enough that we can repair it with a hammer. Because this is a strat that allows us to do the boss without dying, it's a good idea to rest beforehand. And whilst we do that, let's talk about weapon choice. So the best weapon on a random seed speedrun to use for Yag may be different depending on the RNG you get during the run. If you do get the RNG that allows you to go for a Leviathan, it is worth going for a level two Abyssal Razor as it is the fastest weapon to use that you can get extremely quickly on route 
before reaching the Mistlands. The Flint Axe is the next best, but if you don't get RNG that makes it worth it going for either of these weapons, in other words, if the game's forcing you to go too out of the way to gather the necessary mats, it can be more time efficient to just go with the level 3 club if that's all you have resources for. Just remember, if you do go for the Abyssal Razor, you're going to need to make a level 2 workbench in the hole because it does have a level 2 workbench as a repair requirement. So I recommend using a chopping block for this. All right, so now we've got rested. We jump out of the hole and we go and summon Yag. As soon as we summon, we want to immediately run back over, get in the hole, and we want to place this roof tile before he spawns in. Now we're in the hole, we just wait for Yag to crawl on top of our trap. The way that AI works with bosses in this game is that if the boss can't see you, it will still keep walking towards you in order to hunt you down. For this boss fight, we abuse this mechanic by using it to kite Yag onto our bonfire. Because Yag's model also drags its stomach along the ground, it also means his stomach clips through the wood planks. So we can also get a ton of damage in melee in whilst Yag is also sitting on our fire. And these two things combine to be actually a lot of damage for the Yag fight. This may not look like a lot of Yag damage for some casual players, but as far as speedrun strats go for this boss, this is actually a ton of damage. During the fight, I recommend using a full stamina bar and then changing to the hammer and looking at the bonfire. And what you want to do is hit repair whenever either your stamina bar is fully recharged or the bonfire is about to break, whichever one comes first. And we just alternate between repairing the fire and doing melee attacks over and over until Yag is eventually defeated. If we're using glitches, we essentially want to do the exact same thing, but we can do it inside of one of the Yag pillars by clipping in with a chair. Same as before, we want to destroy the chair before Yag spawns in. This time, we want to wait to see where Yag stands before we place the fire to make sure we're in an optimal placement, but we still want to make sure we're placing it within the bounds of the structure so it doesn't destroy it. Then we just rinse and repeat the same process that we did in the hole, making sure that we never leave the structure that we're clipped inside of and periodically repairing both the bonfire and our weapon whenever we need to. For the queen, we want to use the demolisher. This is because all of the sledgehammer type weapons in the game actually clip through walls when you attack. When we go into the boss room, we want to try and get the boss's attention by throwing either a spear or a harpoon, which both immediately aggro any enemies within a certain radius because of the sound that it gives off. Once we've aggroed the queen, we stand in this left corner of the corridor in the entranceway and keep spamming the demolisher attacks, which will then clip through the wall and deal damage to the queen. Eventually, We'll lose Queen's aggro and then we use either a harpoon or a spear to get it back. We do this by aiming in the back right corner of the citadel because that is usually where the Queen goes although her AI is a little random so you might have some trouble getting aggro back. But once she makes a loud screaming sound that's when you know that you successfully aggroed again and then she will appear by the wall and you'll start to see her claws clip through again and you can start spamming the sledgehammer attacks again. Eventually, you will need to repair the demolisher. So you want to leave a black forge outside where you can periodically repair the weapon and then go back in. And you just want to rinse and repeat this process until the queen is eventually defeated. You will also have to deal with any additional enemies that may spawn. And the demolisher is good for this too. However, you might also want to make the carapace spear to help you deal with some of these enemies as well. The only thing that's different about the strategy for a glitched playthrough is that you'll actually clip through the door of the citadel to gain entry and use the stag breaker as your sledgehammer type weapon. This takes a lot longer, but it does mean you don't have to make the seal breaker to gain entry. Plus with some good RNG on some glitch runs, you can still always go with the demolisher. It's just not needing the seal breaker means you may get access to a queen before you have the opportunity to make the demolisher. So the stab breaker is a viable option in that scenario. So those are all the strats for the bosses. 
But even though the bosses are what we spend the entire run looking for and preparing for, most of the run is all about what happens in between the bosses. And there is a ton of strats that help for all the moments in between, some of which are arguably more important than the boss strats. So this guide is far from over. So one of the first strats you'll probably see in the run is the cooking station deer trap strat. This is where we place a cooking station in front of a deer to trap it and then we kill it to get the deer trophies that we then use to summon Ekthir. Throwing a spear at the ground will aggro any nearby enemies which can be used to bait any boars, grey dwarfs or skeletons or any other mobs that we want to bait. This does also work with the Abyssal Harpoon. As we discussed earlier, the reason you may want to use the Harpoon over the Spear is because the way this works is it aggroes because of the sound the Spear makes when it hits the ground. So with Spears, you can throw them closer to ensure the aggro. And the advantage of using a Harpoon is that you don't have to retrieve it. It immediately appears in your hand again. This is why it could be a good idea to use the harpoon to re-aggro the queen because you don't have to put yourself in any danger when retrieving the spear. When mining barnacles on a leviathan, one of the things you can do is actually relog to reset the leviathan's AI. This means that you can farm as many barnacles as you want and continue until it starts to sink. Then when it finally does start sinking, you simply relog and the leviathan will be completely restarted and you can just continue mining. This allows runners to farm an entire leviathan's worth of barnacles if they want and can be used to go for both the abyssal razor and the harpoon. Just from one leviathan. Relogging in general is actually really useful during the run because it actually removes all status effects. This is most commonly used when you get poisoned by a blob or an oozer because you're able to just relog, then when you re-enter, you're no longer poisoned, which prevents the need for poison resistance. It should be noted this actually removes any buffs as well, such as rested or ekthir. So timing is really important with this one. Relogs can also be used to de-aggro, but it only works if you first lose the line of sight of the enemies. No matter how many times you relog, an enemy won't despawn. So if you're still in its line of sight, it simply won't do anything. It's just going to see it as soon as you load in. But this can be used to get out of some pretty tricky scenarios. Although I would say it's not as OP as it sounds. Speaking of relogs, relogs can also be used as a fall damage cancel. Relogging just before you hit the ground will actually cancel fall damage as long as the point at which you logged out is low enough that you won't take any damage. This can be used to survive leaping off the top of mountains or falling out of dungeons during a dungeon clip. It's pretty niche, but it can make for some really epic moments. Relocking can also be used to skip the intro sequence if you don't want to sit through it. The timer doesn't start until you actually start moving, so it doesn't save time in the actual run, but it will save you real time if you don't want to watch the whole thing. However, you probably should because you can use the journey on the Valkyrie to scout out a mountain without actually being timed. But most runners still relog at the start of a run before they hit the ground because every world does start with a thunderstorm and so relogging will remove the wet debuff so you're not immediately starting a world with the disadvantage of reduced stamina regen. It is worth noting that they are planning on adding a feature that allows you to skip the intro without doing this but it's not in the game yet and it could be a while plus we don't know if that will definitely remove the wet debuff yet. One of the reasons that the spear is a go-to weapon for most runners is that whilst you're in the crypts you can actually carve out holes in scrap piles that allow you to throw the spear directly through it and therefore cheese any draugas at the other side. Clearing crypts is actually a really important part of the run because it allows you to gather bones at the same time as finding the bone mass rune. And so this cheese is super important. Some enemies like the wolf can be a huge pain to avoid during the run. And one of the ways they can be cheesed is by placing a workbench down and then jumping on top of it. Then as soon as the workbench is about to be destroyed, you can actually repair it. This allows us to stay safe in a lot of situations whilst being attacked by wolves or any other mobs for that matter. And from safety, we can then either kill them with spears or fires or whatever means we want. Some situations aren't as easy to avoid. 
such as dealing with drakes in the mountains. And one pretty common way I use to avoid this is something I like to call Fortnite strats. This basically involves putting down a workbench and building a tiny structure to use as a barrier. It's still very dangerous, but actually can be extremely safe with a lot of practice. One of my favorite things about this move in particular is that if you actually put a fire down somewhere nearby and then seal yourself shut, even when being surrounded by enemies, it can still be possible to get the rested buff, which is absolutely epic. It's also worth noting that the resting status, whilst you're waiting for the rested bonus, also heals you. So this can be used to recover a lot of HP whilst in danger in the mountains or any situation really. Another one of my absolute favorite strats is using the bonfire to defeat abominations and wraiths. To do this, you just place the bonfire in an open area, quickly light it, and make sure that you just keep circle strafing around the bonfire, trying to stay on the opposite side of it as the abomination and dodge rolling any of its melee attacks. Anytime any damage is done to the bonfire, you need to make sure it gets repaired. And as long as you keep that bonfire repaired and you cut the abomination, it'll be dealt with in no time. The exact same strat can actually be used for wraiths. It's actually much easier to do with wraiths except in order for it to work correctly you need to do a much tighter circle strafe around the bonfire and you need to be running a lot faster to keep it on there but it deals with wraiths really really easily abominations can also be used to chop down trees that we don't have an axe for like ancient trees for example we do this by kiting them over and just dodge rolling the melee attacks as they happen you can let them destroy the logs when they're on the ground and just collect the wood and run However, it's worth noting for ancient trees in particular that once the tree is chopped down, any axe will actually work. Likewise, we can actually use Seeker's soldiers to chop down Yggdrasil's shoots to get Yggdrasil wood. You will also need to get the soldier to destroy the log itself as well in this case. Likewise, trolls can be used to get fine wood by getting them to chop down birch trees or oak trees without the need of a bronze or an iron axe. Although, if you're lucky enough, the absolute best source of fine wood is a shipwreck, which can be destroyed by any axe in the game. Fires have already come up multiple times during this video, but I do feel like it's worth mentioning that not only are they really good for dealing with some of the bosses and the more difficult enemies in the game, but fires can also be a really good way to deal with any mob. One way that you can actually use them is by rolling into an enemy to push them onto the fire, whilst also dodging their melee attacks. This is a super fast way to dispatch of any enemy. This also works with the bonfire and draugas. It's actually a really good way to deal with draugas. It's just to push them onto the bonfire because they do have a lot more HP. This strat isn't great for dealing with tons of enemies at once, but if you just got one straggler, it's a perfect way to take care of them. This next one's pretty obvious, but placing campfires in the mountain allows you to survive the cold. And while we have some other ways of dealing with it that we'll get onto later on, sometimes if you have to go over long distances, just go in as far as you can and then place in a fire to then stop and heal inside a shack or something, or just generally just chain in a ton of campfires together can be a good way to traverse mountains if you're struggling with the freezing effect. Golems can be dealt with by jumping onto their head and then just attacking them with a pickaxe because they are actually weak to pickaxes. I think a lot of players are aware of this, but I thought it was worth mentioning because it does come in useful in some speedruns if you absolutely have to deal with a golem. When sailing, always looking down helps you avoid getting aggroed by a serpent. As long as you're not literally right on top of a serpent, it won't aggro unless you look at it. If you're unlucky enough to sail directly into one, this will not prevent the aggro because you can't avoid the line of sight. But looking down during long journeys is a good way to avoid most serpent encounters because it will work for any that you won't sail directly into. Speaking of sailing, Boats can't be deconstructed with the hammer, so pre-breaking your boat during the journey will actually save you a ton of time. You need to carry the mats of your boat with you throughout the run so you can take the most direct route possible. I usually recommend hitting the boat until it visually starts to come apart 
so the boat still has a little bit of HP. Then when you get to the coast, you can finish the boat off with a few hits, gather your mats and be on your way. However, if for whatever reason you find yourself sailing with a higher tier weapon that can destroy the boat quickly, don't bother doing this. It is worth having the extra HP. But if you're running super meta weapons all the time, this is worth doing. You may notice during runs, I'm switching to the hammer all the time. This is because when you have a weapon equipped, it generally reduces your movement speed unless it's a knife. And to unequip it, you have to wait for this animation to happen. And not only that, you can't do the unequip animation while sprinting. You have to stop and then unequip and then resume sprinting. However, if you have a weapon equipped, regardless of whether you're sprinting or not, the hammer has no animation. So you can just immediately switch to it and immediately get the speed boost of having unequipped your weapon. This is not really done as a giant time save during the run. However, it allows you to move more efficiently and during a boss fight or any other enemy encounter, getting that extra speed boost instantaneously can be the difference between life and death when you're trying to avoid attacks. You may also notice several scenarios where I'm rolling with the hammer. The only reason that you can't do this normally in the game by default is because there's some key binds that clash. Therefore, rebinding the build menu to something else allows you to perform a dodge roll with the hammer equipped. I personally have mine on mouse three, but you can put it on whatever you want as long as it doesn't clash with your block mapping. Speaking of dodge rolls, spamming the dodge roll at the same time as the secondary attack actually cancels the secondary attack animation. And because the dodge roll is actually a shorter animation, it allows you to pull off more secondary attacks in a short period of time, which in some New Game Plus categories can be massive time save during the Elder fight. This is one that actually applies to casual gameplay a lot as well, as it does deal massive damage. You're going to need a big stamina bar because it consumes a lot of stamina. And again, all you do is a spam dodge roll and secondary attack at the same time. This new one's a relatively recent discovery. It's referred to as either combo extensions or block enabled combos. To perform this, you hold block with a weapon and then you left click once to attack. And just as the animation returns to the block status, you then hold down left click to start performing combos. And when performed correctly, you actually perform more hits in a shorter period of time. We're a long way from this becoming a real factor in speedruns as it only provides a tiny time advantage and most runners will most likely have a ton of other optimization in their run before it comes down to this. But it is a totally legit and awesome strat that is completely skill based that can gain you some extra DPS if you want to start factoring it in. This next one I call pick climbing. I figure most casual players are already aware of this, but when running up a steep slope, instead of sliding all the way down to recover stamina, you can actually just use the pickaxe to carve yourself a little resting spot so you can then recover stamina, continue running up the mountain or the hill or whatever it is, and then do another resting spot and rinse and repeat. And this does make pretty much any slope traversable in one sitting without sliding all the way down. You do need to do this way in advance of you're running out of stamina because it does require stamina to do and you're going to have to jump into the hole. But nonetheless, it's a totally legit strat. Believe it or not, there are actually a few commands that are allowed during the speed run. This comes from the fact that when you hit the enter key to bring up the chat box, the game actually says that you can do slash die to kill your character or slash reset spawn to reset your spawn. This led to a rule set that allows any vanilla commands that can be done without enabling dev commands, as these actually are expected to be used by the developers during normal gameplay. Most important of these is slash die, as it allows you to kill your character and therefore place a tombstone wherever you want, such as right next to a bed where you can respawn, which can then be collected right away for an instant corpse run buff. Print seeds, which will actually return the distance of any nearby crypts. This is not as powerful as it sounds, as it only works within a few hundred meters, but it is useful particularly in the Black Forest and in the Mistlands, where there's a higher chance of the view being obstructed. Reset Spawn can also be used in conjunction with Slash Die for a quick teleport back to the middle via a Death Warp. This of course means you will lose everything, but in certain rare scenarios, this is actually potentially fine, especially if the only remaining boss is modder and all the other bosses are out of the way 
because you go for all modders eggs at her spawn location and she can just be defeated with a bonfire if you are going to do this however it is recommended that you leave one antler at spawn after beating Ekthia, so you don't have to do the boss fight again and to make sure you do have the pickaxe you're going to need for the modder setup resting can also be accomplished while cooking if done from within a sufficiently sealed shelter or if done while sitting this can mean that you can accomplish a rested buff whilst waiting for your food to cook however in most cases it's generally recommended to do something more productive like gather any needed wood but if there is literally nothing else you need to do this is definitely an added benefit we mentioned corpse run earlier the reason this is a really important strat is because it greatly reduces your jumping stamina usage and your running stamina usage and even though it doesn't state it on the active effect screen it does actually also rapidly restore your health over time this means that we can use it in the mountains to outheal the cold because the rate at which the corpse run buff heals us out heals the rate at which the freezing debuff damages us and therefore as long as we have corpse run in the mountains we can survive without a fire by setting the bed at the base of a mountain then using slash die to place a tombstone we can actually combine ichthyr with the corpse run buff for absolutely massive stamina reduction. Ichthia further reduces your jump and run stamina usage along with the already massive reduction by corpse run to give you a buff that allows you to zoom up a mountain by spamming jump in a way that actually uses no stamina. This is an absolutely essential strat for ascending the mountain on speed runs and the only real reason we take the Ichthia ability at the start of the game as this strat is massive time save another way to get rested that is worth noting is that you can actually get rested while sneaking in some scenarios such as traversing dungeons or areas that may be packed with mobs this is a way that you can get the rested buff without having to kill all the enemies or simply run away to a quieter spot this is a strat i like to call cart looting it's when you place down a cart outside of the effect of the ward in dwarven settlements and you drag the cart into the settlement drag it right up to a ward and then destroy the ward by just crashing the cart into it over and over again this does not aggro any dwarves it's really easy to pull off and once the ward is destroyed you're free to destroy anything within the dwarven settlement without aggroing the dwarves okay now let's talk about dungeon clips so in glitched categories the main difference is you are allowed to clip that means that you can gain entrance to crypts without a crypt key this i'm sure most players know about already but you can easily clip into a crypt by using a chair you just place it to the side of the door as close as the game will let you ensuring that the front of the chair is partially clipped into the wall and you sit in the chair and simply hold w to walk inside the wall and enter the crypt the same clip can actually be performed with a door by placing it outside a crypt then closing it in such a position that the door pushes you through the crypt there's a couple of clips that you can do inside the dungeons as well the most useful one is when you place a sitting log on the ledge right next to the entrance of the crypt you can climb up there using cooking stations then you can press e to sit on the log once you get close enough and when you stand up you'll actually clip through the roof you can actually use this to identify any room types that may have a bone mass rune without having to clear the dungeon itself you can also clip out of burial chambers just by opening the included doors using block to turn and face the door handle letting go and then tapping e and allowing it to push you through the wall this is actually not that useful in burial chambers but it can allow you to traverse a short distance without encountering any enemies and if you land in water or your relog for the full damage cancel it is completely safe to do beds are an essential part of the run as they give you an immediate respawn point there's several fast ways to make a bed but the most common one is to place a bed then take two half walls place it right next to it then take two 26 degree roos and immediately place them over the top and this is actually enough to work as a spawn point then you can actually destroy these and you will respawn in this just fine and once you take your workbench, you'll have used very minimal wood. There are a couple of variations of how to do this. Some of them are slightly faster than others, but no way is actually 100% consistent because of the terrain and the weather differences. 
So most runners will mix up the beds a little bit depending on the situation. And whichever way works best for you is really the way to go. Workbenches are also super important. The fastest workbench that you can really make that works pretty much everywhere is when you just slap your workbench down, you take a wood wall, you place it, trying to get it almost exactly in the middle of the two posts at the back. Then you take your 26 degree thatch roof, place it over top and boom, you've got a repair station with just two pieces of wood. Some scenarios, like if you're in front of a rock or something like this, you will actually just be able to place one roof in some scenarios. In other scenarios, like up against trees, you can actually use the tree as your back support and then place two roofs in a row like this. This can also be done super quickly on the move. Crypts are actually a really important spot where you can build in the speedrun. You can place a workbench so you can jump on top easily. And then you can place a bed on top of the crypt with one of the fast bed build strats. Then once you set your spawn, you actually now have a bed in a spot that mobs will not be able to destroy. And having a safe bed is essential. You can also use the crypt as a place to build more of a base or a storage setup the storing items during longer categories or if you're using portals the underground entrances to infested mines in the mistlands can also provide a safe place to build as long as you've taken care of all the seekers above as they will find the way down and destroy stuff if they're nearby once they're taken care of, this does provide a safe spot where y'alls cannot destroy your bed or your portal. These above ground burial chambers aren't the best case scenario for a bed, but by placing a workbench and jumping on top, you can place a bed on top. That does give you a safe spot against any mobs in the area. It's a little bit more finicky to build on, but it can still be done really fast and having a safe bed is always worth it. One of the best places you can place a bed in the game is actually at the entrance of these sunken burial chambers because the overhang of the entrance provides enough shelter to be able to set it as your spawn right away. And you can do this en route checking the burial chambers for elder runes, which makes this a really efficient bed placement. The entrances to troll caves are also really good for the same reason. And you can do this while looting chests for bones and leather, which are really important for the run. The entrances to ice caves are also really good for a fast bed. And you can do this while checking the cave for a modder rune. Whilst exploring the mistlands, you can actually place a stone cutter to help you destroy the black marble on bridges. This will give you more black marble than you know what to do with and way more than you'll ever need during a run. Then if you place a forge, you'll be able to deconstruct the iron bars, which will give you more iron than you'll ever need on a run too. And these two things combined are a perfect way to farm all the mats that you'll eventually need for a demolisher. Placing a bed and setting your spawn outside a difficult dungeon and then using a tombstone or a chest to store your gear can provide you with a cheap and easy way to explore dungeons without having to worry about getting important items stuck in hard to reach places and allowing you to run ahead and see if you can find anything useful. The last couple of things I wanted to mention are that farming skeletons inside burial chambers can actually be a way faster way to get all the bones you need for level 3 club, especially if you're not lucky enough to find all the bones you need out of troll caves and while doing this if you stand on the right side of the entrance the skeletons won't be able to reach it and it will provide you with a safe place you can hit them from and last but not least it's now more worth it than ever to go for a root harness because even with relatively low tier food and no other armor it'll allow you to survive a death skeeto hit and even in the mistlands both ticks and seekers do mostly pierce damage, which basically makes the root harness a no-brainer because if you use the bonfire strat on the abomination, it's really easy to get. All right, that's just about gonna do it for this one. This was a massive undertaking. There's still a ton of stuff that I could have included in this video that I decided not to because a lot of it is just playing the game normally and game knowledge and getting good at the game. And a lot of it is just strats that aren't particularly useful. But in this video, we officially covered every single strat you need to get a world record in this game. And then legitimately probably like four or 500% more. <laughs> 
So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave a like and a nice positive comment for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe for future content. All those things really help me out because it makes it more likely that the content will show up in the recommended feed. So I'd really appreciate you doing that. And then if you would like to support the content financially, you can do so over on Patreon at patreon.com slash nickrawcliffe. And in return, you'll get access to a couple of private Valheim servers. I do stream live on this very YouTube channel and live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash nickrawcliffe. You can join my Discord and follow me on social media at the links below. And until next time, have a good one.